Talbert, it's great to have you here at uh, University of Missouri-St. Louis at the Center for Character and Citizenship. It's always good to be in your presence, and it's yeah. good to be in St. Louis as well. I we just finished two great days of training of principals and so on. I just wanted to ask you, you know, some questions about your perspective on education, character, kids, and so on, um, so that people can get a, a sense of, of your, your point of view. Um, when... I know when you look at kids, you see them a certain way, and I know that you want educators, when they look at kids, to see them a certain way. What do you want educators to see when they look at a young kid coming into school? You know, I really want them to challenge their ability to imagine the possibilities, you know, because every child will become. Now, the question is, will become what? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what helps that child to become a success in whatever his or her field might be? Uh, Imagine the possibilities. Will this young man become a, a college graduate? Will this lady become uh, a college graduate? You know, will they go on to do great things? Because oftentimes the circumstances that surround the child may often give you your impression of who this child is and who he or she might become. But if you allow your own mental models to be challenged so that you can imagine the possibilities for their future, mm -hmm. looking beyond where they are, looking to who they can become, that's what I want the educator to do. Because they have that great opportunity to do that. Excellent. And, and, and in some senses, your life is the template or model or a template or model for, for that perspective. Um, you, you've done... Um, extremely well. You deserve it. Um, you're creative and bright. And you've written some uh, wonderful books and created great training models and so on. Um, talk a little bit about the journey of your life, um, how it's an example of what you just described, people seeing possibilities in you that you probably didn't see yourself when you were a child. Well, you know, I look at my life from a statistical perspective, and of course I was born to a teenage mother. And, and that's a strike against you right there. Mm -hmm. I didn't know my birth dad until I was 17. That's another uh, strike against you. You know, all of these things were sort of collecting to really determine the outcome of my life, except they were all interrupted by a community of people who had a vision for me that I was mm -hmm. even too young to have for myself. Starting with my great grandparents, uh, Papa Joe and Mama Pearl, you know, they thought I was a part of the constellation. You know, I was, I was a star from their perspective. It didn't matter that all of these other demographics existed. What really mattered was that I was here, I was human, I was their great-grandson, and they wished great things for me. And so that's where I first experienced being able to live beyond the circumstances because someone gives you the right to do that. And there was a long line of other people that you could um, talk about who also saw a possibility in you and teachers, other, well, yeah, other, you know, other, you, other family members. Sure, definitely. And, you know, uh, I was very fortunate with the family members, especially my great aunt, who was like the stalwart in our family because, you know, with a very limited education, uh, this was definitely on her radar screen. You're going to be educated. You live in my house, you're going to be educated. But at the same time, you take this country guy and, and send him to school, coming from the background that I did, uh, it's possible that educators may have uh, not valued me the way they should. But again, it didn't happen that way. These educators welcomed me into that environment. They made me feel I was at home. I was at the right place from the very first day of school to the day I graduated in high school. I mean, some 12 years later, it was absolutely the most incredible journey of becoming that I have ever been involved in. And, you know, and part of the story, um, obviously, as you said, is being born to a teen mom and so on. Um, but another important part of the story is that you were born in uh, Mississippi Delta during illegal segregation and race was an issue. Oh, um, yeah. Would you talk about that one a little bit? You know, it, uh, you know if, uh, for many people that might be listening to us talk, you know, that's an error that is so far removed from their mm -hmm. mind. But for me, it was very, very real. You know, I, I told people I grew up having to learn how to be abnormal because the normal inclination of a human being is to embrace others. You know, as little kids, you know, you gravitate toward another child. You know, it doesn't matter what color the child is. You know, all you want to mm -hmm. do is play and have fun because, what well, you got all the elements there for life. Yeah, sure. But then someone comes in and, and tells you, hold it, you know, you're not supposed to do this, and it goes against the grain. You know, a kid asks 10,000 questions, what are you talking about? And you have to really sit down and, and bring this illogical conversation to some head, and finally parents accept that, you know, you just do what I tell you to do. 
it makes no sense. But yes, legal segregation was a very illogical world that I lived in. And of course, the color of my skin, you know, dictated my movement, uh, the expectations, who I would become, all of those things. And it lasted so long. You know, it, was, it was institutionalized in the world of my youth. Yeah, and as you have told me, it also limited your access to lots of resources, possibilities, how far you had to go on the bus to school, you couldn't go into the library. Um, tell the story of how your, your, your great aunt um, created the library in the house. I love that one. You know, my punk, as we called her, her name is Eleanor, but uh, in the South we use pet names as if the written name really had little or no value. Yeah. But uh, she wanted me to, to be able to read and, and to have a sense of what was going on in the world. And obviously, I wanted to go to the library. Now, why I wanted to go to the library, but I did. But she had to very gingerly explain to me that the color of my skin precluded me from doing so. And she was very upset about that. But her main, her mantra was, you only need to be upset 15 minutes, then you do something about it. Mm. And, and what she decided to do was to write a lot of the black universities in the South, of which there are plenty, especially in Mississippi, and ask them to send their old books. And, and they did. And she made a library in her front room. And now this is not this incredible great room that we have today. You know, this is this is a small front room, but it's her prize her prize room, and uh, and she bought uh, not bought they gave her used apple crates, and I don't know where she got this paint because she was very very much of, of a penny pincher. You know, but some, it may have been given to her, but it's a putrid brown. I mean, it had no hint. Of, of HGTV about it <laughs> at all. And she painted these orange crates a putrid brown, and when the books came through the, you know, through the mail, uh, she just loaded the bookshelves up at all these books. And, uh, and I had to read them. Mm. And what I really remember, reading agronomy books, you know. I mean, I remember reading agronomy books. I don't remember reading C. Jack Run. I didn't know that the little train could. All I knew <laughs> was about agronomy and all this other stuff. But the idea that she had is that if other people could write, you could read. And, and, and that, to me, was really what was important. It left me with a thirst for knowledge. It left me with the idea that reading uh, was very important uh, and that other people had things to say and that I needed to learn those things. Now, I, I know that one of the core themes for you and for the uh, company you've created, this consulting company and so on, is community, and that a lot of that comes from what you just described, the community that made this world possible for you and so on. What's community to you? Why is it important for schools? It's community for me is, is a solid infrastructure of caring individuals where doing things for others come naturally. Uh, and my life would not be here if it had not been for that. Uh, what does it mean for schools? Schools have this incredible opportunity, as I call, to really nurture the life along the K-12 corridor, to really look at young people, imagine the possibilities for them, take in consideration their past, their present, what their future potential can be, and at the same time, uh, use their positions to create a caring environment for them. I mean, making school the one place along their life journey that really helps them to stand tall from the, from the uh, idea of who they are potentially and the impact that they can have. And, and that's why I think community is so important for teachers to build because that's the effective dimension of the workplace, of the, of the school place. That's, you know, how students feel about being where they are, how teachers feel, how the staff feel, you know, how the cook feels, everybody who works there, they, they have feelings. Mm -hmm. And we can create an environment that really takes those feelings to a very high level. And I know a lot of those feelings are the feelings you derive from your experiences back in Glen Allen, Mississippi as a child. Um, but another thing that's become thematic for you is leadership. And I know you do a lot of leadership training literally around the world um, for governmental organizations, for corporations, um, for school leaders and teachers, and lots for youth, for lots of other folks, criminal justice systems, military. Um, why is leadership so important? Because leadership matters. Um, if things could happen without leaders, then perhaps it would. But <laughs> vision needs direction. Uh, people's goals and ambition needs corralling. Uh, people need to be pointed which way to go. Uh, they need to be shown the importance of the vision and collaboration. You need someone who can address the big picture 
and bring people into that picture and keep them focused on what is important. Because as people, we have a tendency to stray away from things. We have a tendency to fall short of things. And for the person who is positioned as a leader, they are challenged to have that big view. You know, the, this is where we're going, and we don't want to lose sight of that. And, uh, you know, you don't want to leave things to chance. And leadership removes chance out of the way, I think. Okay. Um, schools are struggling in many cases to create the community you're talking about, to see the possibilities in the kids you talk about, to provide adequate, enlightened, competent leadership. Um, you have a sense of, you know, if you had a grand message to um, superintendents or to the Secretary of Education or whatever about um, what we need to do to help s schools do better or to keep them from struggling, what might you say? You know, the one thing I would love to see happen is that uh, the, the education of our youth is not politicized, uh, that it does not become something that we bat back and forth like we're volleying a, a, a tennis ball or something. This is too important for that. And, and I think we need to reevaluate the role of the K-12 corridor in, in mm -hmm. our society. You know, a democratic society requires an educated electorate. You know, and, and, we, and we need to have that and to, ma to make sure that we maintain that, that people know what the society is all about and know what's going on so that they can intelligently participate in the government of, of, of all of us. And, but at the same time, you know, I would want superintendents to know that being in that position is not about them. It's about the children. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd want educators to know that if we do not educate those millions of kids, you know, over 50 million kids that pass through the, uh, the K-12 corridor, we mess up everything else because it is from that group of people that we get our, our voters, we get our businessmen and women, we, we, we get the people who will go on to post-secondary education. You've got to stop through that corridor, and it's too important to, to not understand its value and just say, you know, oh, we're just putting kids through school. No, this is about the life of America. Mm. Now, um... You and I have talked about that you've lately been thinking about race in contemporary America and the way race now plays a role in your life and psyche or in the world you live in, the way people think of each other and treat each other. Um, I grew up in uh, first urban, then suburban, northeast um, U.S., and white, I'm Jewish. You grew up um, African Americans, southern, you know, rural farming country in Mississippi during legal segregation and so on. We come, you know, we come from different worlds, so I can't be in your head and be in your shoes and know what it's like. But I wonder if you wanted to talk a little bit about what message you'd want to impart from, you know, your many, many decades of life, <laughs> looking <you>. back, <laughs> and thinking, what have you learned about race in America? What message would you want to send out to kids in schools and educators that some things they need to be aware of and sensitive to? You know, the, 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 the fact that color matters in our country, you know, I would, would hope that we would get to the point when, when it doesn't, but uh, it, it still does. But at the same time, I, I would want people to understand that the lessons that were taught that made the racial divide as it was, those lessons were taught to last a lifetime. They were not temporary conversations. Mm. And when things are taught to last a lifetime, guess what? They tend to last a lifetime. And beyond. On, and beyond, <laughs> on both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I still hear things in my head that causes me to think survival. And what I mean by that is, how do I maneuver? Uh, you know, in one of the classes today, I, I was talking to some of the students saying that, you know, as an African-American kid, my grandpa had to teach me two lessons. One is how to safely maneuver among white people in the South. Mm -hmm. Safely maneuver. That's a real strategic lesson. Mm -hmm. And the other lesson was how to be this great person that they knew me to be who happened to have been black. So I had to learn how to be a great black guy because that's who I am. And I had to learn how to be a Southerner living in a segregated world and how to fashion my wall in, in order not to bring harm to myself and others. So in some ways you had to have a split personality. You almost became schizophrenic. Wow. Okay. And that the vestiges remain, you can't erase them all. You can't. You know, there's so, you know, the mere fact that we're talking tells me that, that life has changed drastically. I look around me at the guys who's handling the camera yeah. and the camaraderie that I see among them, one white, one black, that yeah. tells me something. That tells me that there are generations coming after me that 
thank God, will not be saddled with the mental models that, ring, you know, that hang around my head, you know, telling me what to do. And, and my son looks at life from an entirely different perspective, and he mm -hmm. should. And hopefully his children will look at life from an entirely different perspective. Well, I mean, let's talk a minute about your son, Marshall. Um, would you want the message to him to be, I mean, do you want to, is there part of you that wants to caution him, be aware that people will always see your skin color, or, is part, or do you want to not give him that message? I want to not, but I do. Because I have to. Okay. Because I know it's there. Okay. It may be subtle, but it does show up. And, uh, and he has to understand how not to let that thing that shows up define him. See, that's the great lesson I learned from my great-grandparents sure, sure. and the people who took care of me. They said, we, we don't have any control over society, mm -hmm. but we do have control over our house, and we can talk about lessons within our house to protect your personality so that you won't become a victim to the schizophrenic world that mm -hmm. you happen to live in. One, one last subject I want to switch to, and that's to do with media. Um, and I'm wondering, I don't know how much you've thought about this, but have you thought about the impact of media on kids today and, and their character and values and so on? And if so, you know, what, what have you concluded? You know, well, it's, it's very easy to say that uh, the media in our society is designed to, to impact decisions and choices and to and sell you a bill of goods and a way of life. Mm -hmm. And so it goes without question that all of us, adults and youth, are being impacted by the media. And if that media is, is not really being, uh, if they're not coming in, 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 into the forefront of our lives because of their own level of unselfishness, then they're going to be motivated by greed, the bottom line, and some other things that they want to sell and move across the, the spectrum of our lives. And in so doing, they may push things that are detrimental to us because they're economically feasible and, and they really make sense economically, but they may not make any sense from the standpoint of developing our behavior system and our personalities, and, and it may put us in direct opposition to what it means to be a person who thinks about the values and the relationships we have with other people. It, it, it kind of put, you know, this is me, so let me do what I need to do in order mm -hmm. to accomplish what I need to accomplish but in good community that we need to build and sustain, it's really, it's all about us. You know, we're in this together. It's all about us. Now, how do we, what do we do with kids to help them capture the positive effects of media? Because I mean, there's potential in the media for kids to use it um, for good. Have you seen examples of that or have any thoughts about, you know, how we can educate kids to buttress them against these negative right. effects you're talking about, but also... You know, how do we get them to engage media in ways that are good for society? You know, you, you, without question, you look at the Discovery Channel, you look at some of the History Channels. I mean, there's some incredible things come on television that take you to words you never dreamed of. They take you down in caves you didn't know were there and mm -hmm. underground places of light that just absolutely bottle, you know, boggles your mind. But I, I think it has to start early. You know, parents have to perhaps become more involved in the process of saying, of sitting down with their kids, you know, and saying we're going to watch this and being able to discuss it. Now, that may not ring true in every home, but I think every home should be thinking about what's impacting the life of my child. Mm. Because if you see something that is detrimental over and over and over again, the mere fact that we show it seems to validate that it's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and if you're not taught how to distinguish between what is okay and what is not, you just may assume that, yeah, these things are fine. You know, we can, we can do this. But there are so many things that come across the media that are not good, and there are so many things that come across the media that are absolutely exceptional. I think the schools can play a role in that, uh, bringing the media in, you know, in certain uh, classes so that students will realize that this mm -hmm. technology is a tool that can be very educational, very fulfilling. But at the same time, you want them to have a sense of discernment you know, what, what triggers the wrong buttons inside of me and what triggers the right buttons mm -hmm. inside of me so that, uh, so that they, because you can't be with a kid 24-7, right. you know, so at some point, you know, they're going to have, you know, just like with adults, you know, we just have to make the decisions ourselves. Yeah, I want to go this way, but, you know, uh, better not do that. And, and we have reasons for that, that that comes from training and socialization and, and other things. And I, I think that kids need to somehow be able 
to know when to turn certain buttons off and when to turn certain, certain buttons on. And that can be expanded to a variety of other risk, risky behaviors, whether it's drugs or, you know, f you know gang membership or um, you know, whatever, you know, all kinds of risk-taking. Um, what do you think are, are some of the best ways we can help youth avoid the path of sort of unhealthy, risky, um, potentially really harmful choices. You know, and this is where the media, I think, does not help us as much as it can because oftentimes the media celebrates risky behavior mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they idolize risk takers who are taking it from that perspective and, and they idolize the actions that are, being, uh, that, that are being lived out. So for a young person seeing that, you know, you, you begin to come up with an idea of what turns me on, what makes me feel good, what mm -hmm. makes me excited, because the media tells us that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I really don't know. I mean, okay. it's, I, I would love to be able to succinctly answer that, Marvin, yeah. but it's, it, it, it's, it's such a, it, it involves the community of faith, it involves our homes, it involves our schools, it involves so many people in the adult community's understanding that we do have a responsibility to the generation beneath us. Mm -hmm. We have a responsibility to help them understand who they can become, and more importantly, that they're more than just a child on their way to the playground. They are a child on their way to citizenship, to becoming a productive, caring citizen. And too often, they don't hear that. They don't see their future from that responsible and accountable perspective. What do you hope your legacy is going to be for all this work? <laughs> Oh, Marvin, when you use the word legacy, that, that's, that's <laughs> such a ring to it. <laughs> you know, what are the ripples that you hope you leave behind? That people matter, and that even in the worst set of circumstances, good people, regardless of race, creed, or color, can come to your rescue and can really help you to, to embrace yourself and to do things that you thought you couldn't do. Um, and, and leave the art of reading. Uh, I, I want people to always realize that their story matters and, and, and that it is from these stories that we find pieces of ourselves. And in so doing, we end up really being able to celebrate our shared humanity. Cliff, it is always a treat. Thank you, sir. Would you do me a favor and say the name of your website? Yes, it is www.cliftontalbert.com. Great talking to you. My pleasure, sir.